So uh, go ahead, uh, Jack. Cool, thanks, Ilse. Um, yeah, it's great to talk to everyone, um, even if it's not in person. I'll give a shout out to everyone in YouTube who's watching as well. Um, so this afternoon, I'm going to talk about wide field imaging. Um, it's a little bit different to what we had before because, well, as you'll see, a lot of this actually isn't part of CASA just yet. Um, and it's kind of a very big uh, kind of area of research just at the moment. Um, I'm from the University of Pretoria, so greetings from South Africa. And if you have questions on this, then please put them in the MetaMaze channel or you can email me uh, later on as well if, if needs be. So this is kind of our, our motivation. Um, so I'm gonna do a little bit of science, which haven't really been done um, before in these talks. Um, so why would you ever wanna image the degrees of the sky with VLBI? And then I'm gonna talk a bit about the uh, challenges that, that come up when we wanna do wide field imaging. Um, and then followed on by a bit about the, you know, how we calibrate wide field VLBI data. Um, and in particular, there's kind of three aspects which are a little bit different to your standard calibration. Um, that's the, the phase referencing, your self calibration, and also, as I'll talk about for almost 10 slides, will be the, how we do primary beam correction. And then I'll finish with some conclusions and takeaway points. Um, but the key thing with this talk as well, for those who you know only care about their source in the center of the field, and you know, might just be going to watch the US elections instead. So I'm going to try and show you how some of the techniques that we do for wide fields observing might be applicable to your observing just the tiny, you know, couple of arc seconds in the center of your field. Um, so let me begin. So this is kind of just what do we mean by wide field, B B field BI? Um, and this is, well, for, for those who don't do much radio astronomy or or it's just started, you know, this is just simply concerned with imaging the entire primary beam of an array. And the primary beam, as you should know from Radio Shawnee 101, is effectively your directionality of your telescopes or the gain, um, or in a non-technical term, just a, your effective sensitivity as a function of uh, your sky coordinates. Now, the key thing about using uh, VLBI is that you can now see multiple science targets in a single observation. Um, and on the right hand side here, we've got a lovely JVLA plus Merlin image of the Goods, uh, Goods North Deep Field. And you can see multiple sources uh, being shown. And then as you get to the, the edge of the primary beam, the noise increases because you're effectively less uh, sensitive there. Now, historically, this is much easier for shorter baseline instruments. And lots of the problems that come with wild field imaging have been solved for shorter baseline instruments. Um, but with VLBI, you've kind of got a unique way of, of looking at many different phenomena that you wouldn't see in your arc second scale resolution uh, instruments. So here's some kind of science examples. Um, so there's, you know, the classic supermassive black hole binary uh, issue where, you know, these are important to galaxy formation theories, etc. You know, that's the, uh, this wasn't from a wide field VLBI server by Roger Dean in 2014, but is a nature paper of a a triple supermassive black hole. But then in the Cosmos VLBA survey by Noela Herrera Ruiz in 2017, they saw two candidate supermassive black hole binaries. If you're looking at this with your VLA telescope, this would just be a single boring blob and you wouldn't know what's under, happening underneath the, uh, the flux. And even in our Goods North survey, um, we've got a candidate uh, supermassive black hole binary where you can see in the background on the right hand side is the uh, HST near infrared with two opt optical peaks and we have two VLBI detections in this object. So this is just one of the many things. We've also got you know these beautiful gravitational lenses which Christiana um, is pivotal in bringing out and this is our you know our mascot for our conference um, and these things are rare but the, you know, the high resolution VLBI can constrain your lens models, uh, give you probing of kind of low mass end of the dark matter halo mass function. This is important in how, you know, dark matter grows in the universe. Um, but you can only see this again using VLBI, at least on, on these sort of scales. Um, and indeed, Christiana in 2019, you know, she searched 3,640 MGI-20 sources, which is a, a wide field VLBI survey of the, uh, following the first uh, VLA catalog, and found two gravitational lenses in there. 
So, you know, if you get a statistical sample of these things, you can, you know, probe cosmology and much more using the, the high resolution afforded by VLBI. Now, at least to date, most of the work has been done on AGN surveys. So Edda Middleberg and Noela Herrera Ruiz and myself um, have been working on this for almost 10 years now. I haven't. Um, and, you know, VLBI is a kind of a sure indicator of AGN activity. You have high brightness temperatures, so at high redshifts you get, uh, it's most likely going to be from an AGN. And then you can use VLBI detections then to try and understand the nature of radio made AGN, feedback, et cetera, et cetera. On top of this, you know, we can find that, you know, other AGN identification methods, so far infrared X-rays are sometimes incomplete or contaminated by star from the galaxies. Now, this is just kind of a taster of the things you wanted to do with, you can do with wildfield VLBI, but there's many, many other use cases. So if you guys out there are thinking, oh, this could be useful for my science, then Put in a proposal, um, and you can uh, you can get some nice wide field VLBI data. And I'm going to show you how you know you can calibrate it and how easy it is nowadays. It used to be quite difficult. So you know we've got to look at what are the challenges of imaging the entire primary beam, um, and the first one is just the sheer image size. So let's us assume you know a 0.5 degree field of view which is you know a 25 meter telescope at 1.4 gigahertz approximately um, and you Nyquist sample your your restoring beam by three times the um, three times the Gaussian width of the restoring beam and if you wanted to do this for the VLA or the very large array in the a configuration so you're looking at 32 kilometer baselines which gives you 1.4 arc second resolution, you're looking at you know an image which is 1.4 times 10 to the 7 pixels which is about 4000 on the size and you know this is doable with with modern day computers but if you then go to the very long baseline array with the same antennas 25 meters 1.4 gigahertz but now you have a 6 milliard second resolution you're looking at something in excess of 1 times 10 to the 11 pixels to try and image and there isn't many computers in the world that would be able to make a 300,000 by 300,000 image. Um, not that I know of anyway. Um, please put them in the chat if you, uh, if you know of one that can do that, because I'll be very interested. The second issue that you have is smearing. So, you know, as Ivan uh, said yesterday with the, the equation, you just need a little bit of time averaging and a little bit of uh, frequency averaging to get this smearing effect drastically constraining your field of view. Um, and this effect is, is more uh, prevalent when you have long baselines or when you're going far away from your primary beam. And you guys can think of it as kind of a, a breakdown of our radio interferometer measurement equation. So, you know, we, we have to average over time and frequency in the radio interferometer measurement equation. And when we, for example, do it in, in frequency space, the assumption of a monochromatic source breaks down. And this occurs much worse when we get to the edge of the primary beam. Um, so on the left here, we've got the, the MVSS of two, two sources. This one's at our phase tracking center, and this one's far away towards the edge of the, the Merlin primary beam. And you can see that you know, the source structure looks okay. It looks fairly you know, normal, I guess. But when we go to E Merlin, which has longer baselines, at the center of the primary beam, we don't have this smearing effect. Um, the source looks okay with a nice jet shape, uh, double-sided jet. But when we get to this sort which, source, which is just a point source in the VLA, you know, this is massively smeared. It looks kind of like a meteorite. Um, and this is, this is just wrong. And as Ivan said, this is just a convolutional effect, which is smeared your imaging. So this is another effect that's the issue with uh, we're doing this. And then the final effect, of course, is the what we call the non-coplanarity term or the W term. Um, people who have done wide field VLA or unconnected interferometers will have, you know, despised this term. Um, and, you know, if we look at the ideal radio interferometer equation up here, you know, if we want to do the 2D Fourier transform, we need to somehow get rid of this W term. And when you have either large L or large M, so you're making large images, this W term over here is non-negligible, but also this W term essentially tells you whether you can approximate your interferometer on a 2D plane, 
That's one way to kind of think about it. And when you have VLBI interferometers, which are on the other side of the world, this W term is also going to be quite large. Um, so this makes it much more difficult to, uh, to image. Um, and you can see in this, this image here, we, we've got a email in source, which is seven and a half arc minutes from our pointing center. And on the left-hand side, we've essentially used the W projection algorithm to fix for this W term over here. So we take this into account and you can see that we've kind of got something that looks like a, a source for some out calibration errors, but don't worry about this. Um, but this, you know, this projection is computationally expensive. Um, and if you didn't use W projection, you know, we end up with this weird ring smeared shape. Our peak flux is much uh, is reduced. And, you know, we end up with this weird hole in the center. And no, this is not what the EHT did to get their uh, black hole image. But the, the key thing of this is that the severity of these issues is essentially proportional to your baseline length, well, not exactly proportional, and your distance from the phase center. So they just get worse um, as you go further away. So how do we get around this? What are our solutions to this? So one of them is to do a standard wide field correlation when you do the VLA or email, and this is the standard way of doing it. And all that you do is you correlate at some very, very high temporal and frequency resolution, which then restrains your smearing. Remember uh, Ivan's equation, you know, if you do less, uh, less averaging, then you end up with uh, a much larger field of view. And so here on the right hand side, for example, we've got a example wide field VLBI survey I want to do um, of M82. There's a nice uh, optical image, the only optical image I've ever made in my life. And the, uh, the yellow circle on the outside is just the half power beam width of the EVN or of the Effelsberg and Lovell telescopes combined. And, you know, by doing the correlation at very high in temporal and frequency resolution, we end up with some field of view due to our smearing. And you normally select this to be, oh, I only want 10% smearing or something like that, that's typical. But the result that you get from this correlation is you end up with one huge monolithic uh, data set. And, you know, because VLBI sources are few and far between, this is gonna be 99.999% noise. Um, and on top of this, you know, the averaging is a, is a kind of play up between how big do you want your data to be um and how accurate do you want your imaging to be and so this huge single data set is going to often be terabytes in size and at least when this was first conceived with apes which used a single core this was not feasible um, and often on top of this you know you have to sh if you want to shift to other positions in the primary beam the standard software is just simply not accurate enough to be able to shift um, and retain your astrometry that you need. And just to kind of, you know, highlight this a little bit more is that, you know, if you take a, a 12 telescope, 12 hour EVN observation at one giga, gigabit per second, you're looking at kind of in excess of 15 terabytes single data set. Um, and unless you're doing low far, you're not gonna be able to reduce that. So the second way, which was conceived by John Morgan, Adam Della, and Art uh, Kimpema, I never say his name right, but he's been helping you with the Jupyter Notebooks, is this method of multiple phase center correlation. Okay, and this works slightly differently uh, to our standard correlation. And this way of correlating instead splits our data into time chunks. So here's our time chunk, of little, little time chunk of data which then you correlate or do an initial pass at very, very high time and frequency resolution, which restrains your smearing to the edge of the primary beam. Now, what you then do, and this is highly parallelizable, is you then copy this data set, once correlated, and phase shift using an accurate phase rotation to multiple locations in your primary beam. So now, you know, we set these positions so they can cover, for example, our, our you know, our M82 and we're not looking at just noise over here and things like this. And then on top of this, you then average down those data sets, which are now being phase rotated in time and frequency. And so the result of this is that you, you know, you do this again, you do it for the whole observation and build up your data sets. But the result of this is you end up receiving lots and lots of small uh, data sets in both field of view and their physical size, physical disk size, 
which are at different positions across your primary beam. And this is a stupidly parallelizable um, uh, method, and it greatly simplifies all of the aforementioned issues. So remember your W term gets larger as you go for larger images. This doesn't occur anymore because your face, you're only going to make small images. Um, you don't have to make huge image sizes, single image sizes anymore because you've only got small images. You make lots and lots of small images. So this kind of saves you, um, saves you in the long run and it's really easy. Um, but the advantage as well is that the choice of these face sensors is also up to the user. So um, you could set them so they cover the entire primary beam, which if it's 99.99% .99 noise, why would you do that? Or you could just do it with some sources of known uh, some sources of interest. So say if you've already got a VLA observation of the field, then you could just select those VLA sources because if there's a VLA source, there's more, it's more likely there's going to be a VLBI source just because how point sources work on all spatial scales. So this is kind of the, the method which is done nowadays. And uh, in the next steps, I'm going to talk about kind of the different uh, calibration steps, which we have to do slightly differently because of the way this data is set up. And, you know, this calibrating wide field VLBI data is much easier than you think. Um, and I'm just going to do a disclaimer that the next bunch of slides is not a shameless self-promotion of everything that I've done. It's just simply that not many people do wide field VLBI anymore or do wide field VLBI full stop. But what I'm going to try and convince you guys today is that it's no it's not much different to standard VLBI calibration. And also some of these techniques will have some uh, relevance to if you just care about one source of the, the pointing center of your array. So there's kind of three areas that are different from standard VLBI data processing. Um, there's how we apply solutions when we do phase referencing. There's a bit on self-calibration. So I'll kind of um, extrapolate on what Javier has said this morning. And then, of course, there's the big one, which is primary beam corrections. Um, but on top of this, I just want to you know, point out that there's loads of pipelines that are now developed. So Michael Janssen will talk about this tomorrow, but the ARPA-CAR pipeline is very, very good. Um, but there's also other ones in development on top. There's my own, which I'm going to plug in a minute, um, and also the EVN CASA pipeline, which uh, uh, Ilse spoke about yesterday. And this can make your calibration much, much easier. Um, so I'm just going to have a slide on a shameless plug. I'm really sorry. Um, but as part of, you know, the wide field surveys I've been involved in, we have our own centimeter VLBI pipeline. Um, it's built so it's modular. So if you want to use ARPA card to do the fringe fitting, because it's much better at doing fringe fitting than this one, um, then you can use that and then use the, the centimeter VLBI pipeline to do all the wide field VLBI extra things. Um, and this pipeline, you know, will do all the a priori EVM, VLA, VLBA data stuff. Um, and it's all in parallel through CASA MPI. Um, but it also has kind of support for use on HPC clusters, which are controlled by SLIRM or PBS Pro. Um, and also if they use Singularity, it will also support this. But it's also useful, usable on your local machines too. Um, at the moment, it's just me that's been using it because I only built it a few months ago, but it does need some testers if you want to have a go with it. Um, and it's just to let you know, it's built for wide field surveys, but the direction independent calibration at least works for normal data, at least for continuum data. Um, and there's lots of other things which I'll describe in the next few slides, like the primary green correction schemes, the multi-source self-calibration and how we automate selecting the parameters, um, which I won't talk about in this talk. So that's just my, my shameless plug, I'm sorry. Um, I'll get back to the talk. So with uh, calibrating wide field VLBI data, typically what you're gonna have is one of these phase centers in your beam will have a, uh, uh, will have a the phase bandpass and fringe finders attached. Um, this, of course, remember these data sets are about a few gigabytes each. But the most important thing is that for every phase center that you get, these may, it may be thousands of phase centers, your standard VLBI calibration applies. So you can derive all of your calibration uh, onto this single phase referencing, uh, this single phase center. And then you can take these calibration tables and all of your flagging tables that are derived, and you can apply these to all the other target fields, kind of like this. Okay, and you've gone from 
doing a very small data set, which is a few gigabytes in size, fully calibrating it. And then you've just calibrated terabytes of data and an entire primary beam in VLBI. Um, this, of course, is easily parallelizable because these same calibration solutions work for all of the phase centers. Um, and at least in the, the pipeline that I have, this is implemented using CASA MPR. So it should be compatible with how CASA works in the moment. Now, on top of this is kind of the first difference between wide field VLBI data, but the second one goes on the lines of self-calibrating. Um, and so let's take these, these three telescopes here. We've got some very short baselines here, and these telescopes kind of look through the, the same patch of uh, the atmosphere. But when you get to VLBI baselines, your uh, corruption due to the atmosphere, whether it's the troposphere or ionosphere, depending on uh, what frequency you're observing at, will now be uncorrelated. So you know, these effects are more severe. Um, and often, again, these, these effects can also be uncorrelated at different locations within the target field. People who do low far definitely know about this. So, you know, in order for us to be able to remove these contributions, we have to do self-calibration as, as Javier has shown. But one of the issues that you have is that the number density of VLBI sources and their corresponding flux densities, you know, because you resolve out flux, you don't pick up all the fluffy emission, uh, the fluffy jets in VLBI means that sometimes you may not have enough signal to noise to be able to self-calibrate your target field. So there's kind of two ways which we get around this. Solution number one by Joan Robel and Mike Garrett, definitely used this in, in the early 2000s, is that it's called in-beam phase referencing. And essentially what you do is you just put a phase sensor on some very, very bright VLBI detection in the target field, um, as is shown by the little diagram below. And then you use this to derive the self-calibration solutions. Um, and you, know, you then apply all these solutions to the other phase centers like this. Ta -da. So you know, this works if you have a bright enough target field source. Um, of course, you're never going to have that all the time. So instead, uh, myself and Anna Middleberg developed the multi-source self-calibration technique. And similar to the way that if you did a VLA image of an entire field, you'd use the model from multiple sources to do your self-calibration solutions. This kind of takes advantage of the, the multiple phase center correlation method um, to be able to do self-calibration solutions by combining all of the flux that you get in all the VLBI detections you get in your field. So how does this currently work? So, you know, we have our VLBI detections down here, these uh, blue, blue sources, which we've just done, found through some source finder. Um, we take these VLBI detections and we copy them, we move them, and then we uh, divide the model that we get through clean for each of them by the visibility. So you end up with an approximate one Jansky point source, and then we stack these together. So they're all approximately one Jansky point source and you stack them together. And then you end up with something which is uh, much higher signal to noise and is consistent with one gen with a normalized point source. You then you know, derive your self calibration solutions using this. And once you derive your self calibration solutions, you can then apply all these self calibration solutions back to all the other phase centers. And then you can image these phase sensors again and repeat them if necessary. And, and one thing you may find, for example, is that one of these phase sensors now shows a source that can then be used in this multi source self calibration. And the one thing to say about this is actually, if you care about, oh, what's this going to do to my astrometry, the multi source self cal at least preserves relative astrometry in your field. Um, and that's been proven. You can see the review by Maria Rioca uh, about this. And so just to show what it does, this is from the Goods North field on a, a single source. And with standard phase referencing, uh, this is our source on the left, we end up with a kind of low signal to noise. It's about 900 microjansky peak with some very, very, very non-Gaussian uh, noise behind it. With just a signal to noise of 43, so that's just the peak. Uh, the RMS times but, uh, divided through by the peak flux. But when we use more self-cal, our noise characteristics are, look a lot better. There's less of these big negatives as we see in the other image. 
and our source flux density has dramatically increased. So we've now got signal sizes of over 100. Now, at least for implementing these, this code, you can, it's available in apes via a parsetung script from the, uh, on my GitHub, but it's also about to be implemented into CASA as well. It's currently being tested. I wouldn't advise you to use it just yet until I've tested it. Now, this is where all the people who are currently asleep watching uh, this because they only care about the center of their, their primary beam should start listening up uh, because most of self cal at least can be used not just for wide field VLBI data sets. So again, your standard VLBI will normally just target some central field of view in the center. This may not provide enough signal to noise for cell calibration, especially if you don't know what the VLBI structure looks like. But often there's gonna be more uh, radio sources in the field of view. You may have a, a VLA image of the field. You just do a wide field image. Oh, and look, hey, there's a, a giant source here. There's a really powerful point source here. And so what you could do is you could then use the multiple phase center correlation as is shown here, this source in the center that you care about to target these bright sources. And even though you may not know what's, what's there in terms of the VLBI flux density, you may just get enough signal to noise to be able to self calibrate your data set. Plus on top, you know, you may find something interesting. Wow, there's a, a binary supermassive black hole just out there. And indeed, we've, we've done this in, in real EVN data. So, um, well, EVN observations, they haven't been calibrated yet. And this is just a, a giant radio galaxy ESO 42 as seen by ATCA, which is our, our background here. Um, and then we wanted to, to use the EVN and plus email in to try and see how the, the a uh, fine structure of this jet in the core uh, is essentially. But on top of this, you know, we didn't know how bright the VLBI source will be in the core because you don't know how much flux is going to get resolved out. So instead, we also dropped a couple of phase sensors on these bright ACA point sources, which may just give us enough flux to be able to do self calibration. So that's kind of the, the second difference that we have for, for wide field VLBI, and I hope I don't scare you now with maths. Um, but the kind of final problem, or I like to call it the final frontier, as I did in my, my cheesy proposal for this, um, is the primary beam problem. Um, and the primary beam problems have been solved or mostly solved for all of your nice homogeneous uh, arrays like Meerkat and well, partially Alma. Um, and the VLA, but you know, primary beams are essentially our most ubiquitous direction dependent effects that affects every single radio observation. And so I'm just going to, to focus you back to the, the rhyme that, that Mark first introduced. Um, and so if we just have two antennas P and Q, the visibilities that are measured um, is just the 2D, well, approximately the 2D Fourier transform of your sky brightness distribution. But then on top of this, you also have these um, extra corrupting effects. So these are the G terms here, what we call direction independent effects. So these are the ones which are based in your telescope has no real dependence on um, where you're looking in your target field. So things like the band pass, your complex gate areas can be approximated as direction independent. Um, but then on top of this, we have direction dependent effects. And the primary beam is one of these direction dependent effects. And you can see that this sits inside this, this Fourier transform integral. So if you invert it, you've also got to somehow deal with these corrupting effects as well. Um, and what we will show in the next slides is that this is kind of a more problem for, for heterogeneous arrays, which is mostly VLBI arrays. And that's mainly why this hasn't been dealt with too much because no one did wide field VLBI surveys, nor did they, uh, they care. It was, and the, most of these are heterogeneous uh, arrays like the EVN, uh, the LBA, et cetera. So for homogeneous arrays like the VLBA, uh, the VLA, Meerkat, et cetera, you know, the standard assumption that you would do, um, I'm going to ignore everything to do with phase issues. I'm going to ignore the blockages and the, the side lobe structure. You can go and read up papers on this. I'm just looking at the, the primary lobe. And so, you know, the standard assumption here is that your primary beam for each telescope is identical. So EP Q equals E for all of your, your antennas. And this is generally not varying with time. It does when you have side lobes and it rotates through or squints and things like this. But in a simple terms, this basically means that each baseline observes the same apparent brightness distribution. And that is key for 
anything that you do with, with standard imaging. So your standard imaging algorithms, when you invert the, this equation to recover your, your B term here, assumes that each baseline observes the same apparent brightness distribution or a common sky. Um, and then due to this, you can then invert your baselines to form the UV plane. And so in this case, the apparent sky is the same for every single antenna. And so when you end up inverting this, uh, when you end up inverting this equation, you just recover B app here. Um, and you can then just divide this through by the primary beam response in LMM in the image plane to recover what your true sky brightness is. Um, this of course is not true with this rotation effect, but it can be approximately true. Um, and so any images generated uh, will be the brightness tenured by a power beam. So the true source flux density will be recovered by dividing the image by the power beam response. So on the right here, we've got a nice image of the Goods North field as seen by the VLA. And then we just apply the power beam and you end up with the noise increasing on the outside along with the flux um, and no real change in kind of the, the image fidelity of each of the sources here. Now, when we go to heterogeneous arrays, which is kind of um, what we're trying to solve just at the moment, the big issue comes from the following. It's the fact that, you know, your apparent sky that you see, these, these uh, E terms, which correspond to the, your primary beam voltages are not the same for all your telescopes. If you have a 76 meter telescope, it's gonna have a different voltage pattern to a 25 meter telescope. And so this is key is that each baseline now does not observe the apparent baseline distribution and if this happens, it manifests as some direction dependent, but antenna independent and dominant, dominant amplitude error. And so you can see this in the right hand plot where we've got the VLBA, which is a homogeneous array, plus the Green Bank Telescope, which is a 100 meter telescope in comparison. And Noela Herrera Ruiz in 2018 um, essentially moved this telescope around, getting further and further away from this bright source in the center through C84. And you can see in the, uh, the apes plots, I've got to get an apes plot in, you can see that this occurs as some amplitude error, which is proportional to the distance from this source. And so if you try to invert this, this would be some horrible, horrible amplitude error in your data. And so we can show this kind of more drastically, um, again, through some simulations. Um, and this can drastically affect you know what achievable dynamic range you can get especially very close to the face uh, the pointing center where your telescopes are pointing to um, and below for example we've got a, a simple simulation of an email in array where we've approximated the primary beams as being homogeneous and the same and an email in b array which has two telescope sizes um, and these are observing some point source with a, a fixed dynamic range above what the nominal sensitivity is of about a thousand and you can see that with the email in A array, as you get further and further from uh, the offset from the pointing center where your telescopes are pointing, there's no real change because they're homogenous. You just get adjusted by this, uh, the primary beam amplitudes all the same, so it doesn't do anything. But when you get to the email in B array, you start seeing these amplitude errors coming out further and further as you move further down the primary beam. And so these will effectively, you know, destroy any image quality of sources that you're looking at and also sources nearby. And we showed this with also, you know, very, very heterogeneous arrays. So EVN arrays um, here, and you can see as we go from email in A to email EVN B, the number of different antennas changes. Um, and you can see here, for example, on the top, we've got the, the peak brightness when you don't have primary beam correction and the peak brightness when you do have primary beam correction. And this is just the primary beam shape, of course. But now we've got the actual noise in the images and you can see there's no change in the noise essentially for, for email and A, but we get a change in the noise because of this amplitude error for all of our uh, heterogeneous arrays. And this is effectively shown down here with the ratio of the dynamic ranges too. And even at the EVN, when you get you know, a couple of art minutes where you get a drastic change in your dynamic range. Um, but what's worth saying is that, you know, these errors are proportional to your source dynamic range. So if you have a very low signal to noise source, it's not going to affect it so much. It's a multiplicative effect. Now, these effects are going to be much more important when we start increasing our VLBI bandwidths. 
plus also the inclusion of kind of phased up elements such as the Meerkat and SKA. Now to correct for this effect, we need to do models of the primary beams, um, something which, you know, the EVM will hate me for saying this half the time, um, but this is kind of the current status of the current primary beam models. Um, and at least for the VLBA and GBT, there's some estimates for how big the beams are and what they look like. This is the same for E-Merlin, um, but for the EVN, at least this is all about to change. Um, it's been a while. Um, there's kind of an EVN plus E-Merlin joint effort in, to map the EVN stations and also provide independent measurements of E-Merlin stations. Um, and on the right just kind of shows our, our methodology from the proposal um, showing that we'll take our EVN array and move it at these various different distances from some bright source in the center. And then in principle, we should be able to track how the beams look like uh, with distance from the pointing center. Now, at least at the moment, the current primary beam models um, are kind of one to two gigahertz, which is where you do wide field VLBI generally, are pretty crude estimates. Um, so luckily, hopefully in, in the middle of next year, we'll have some nice, beautiful primary beams for you guys to try. So kind of the final part before I run out of breath is um, what are the, the ways which we can correct for the primary beams? Um, so with our primary beam models or approximations at hand, how do we apply these corrections to, to heterogeneous arrays um, and why field field BI data? So there's kind of currently image plane correction, which you do for homogeneous arrays. There's something which I've called differential or stepwise primary beam correction, which is the standard way we'd normally do it. And then there's also the new way of doing UV plane correction via A projection. So if you're going to do it in the image plane, then you know you calculate your total power beam by just taking kind of the average weighted sum of all the baseline beams, which is just the average of the, the voltages of the two telescopes that make up that uh, make up that baseline. So this is our, our voltage of antenna P and our voltage of uh, antenna Q. And then you would just divide this subsequent image by the total power beam. So the weighted sum of all these baseline beams is the weights down here. Now this you know, is fine for our homogeneous arrays. Um, it provides just some scalar shift in the image plane to fix your flux scaling, um, but it does not correct for your uh, direction dependent antenna independent errors that we've seen earlier. So you know, it won't fix this error that we saw when we were looking at this heterogeneous array. Now, in principle, you can fix some of these amplitude errors via self-calibration, but if your source isn't strong enough, you can't. So the second way is that we use what we call differential or stepwise primary beam correction. And because we've got our, um, our multiple phase sensors at different parts in the primary beam, we can then use a, just a singular gain table, which corrects for your, um, corrects for your primary beam attenuation uh, at the center of that phase center. Um, so this is kind of what I've been saying here at the start, which is you know, correct each phase center in the UV plane using a gain table with some singular value of each antenna's primary V voltage, which you then evaluate at the center of the phase center. Okay, and so this effectively removes these, these E terms at the center of the, the phase center um, in the UV plane. So this will remove those, those horrible amplitude errors. And then occasionally outside of these phase sensors, because it's kind of just for the phase sensor, you would um, calculate the error difference between what the real primary beam response is and the UV corrective response to for any sources away from the phase sensor center. Um, but this is, yeah, so kind of note that this kind of only perfectly corrects your amplitude errors at the center of each phase center. So um, it's not perfect, but it does a pretty good job. Um, and any residual amplitude errors that are left in your data are much, much smaller than the image plane only correction. Um, and these are, are proportional to, to the slope of your primary beam response, the distance from the center of the phase center, and any primary beam model errors that you may have. And so here's kind of an example. We've got, I've simulated a 12 hour EVN observation. Um, yeah. And I've, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I've simulated a, a 12 hour EVN observation. And these are our phase sensors, these Cayenne points over here. And in the background is the primary beam response. And when we do the, the uh, primary beam correction in this method, um, we end up with kind of this fly's eye 
uh, image where your primary beam correction is correct for the center, but as you move to the edge of the uh, phase centers, the, you get some, some error, some residual amplitude error in there. And so this method has been, is the current way which is used in wide field studies. Um, at least in apes, there's, there's a task called CLVLB, um, which you can do it for the VLBA and, and GBT. And then for the EVM, um, you can either use the script that I uh, made, or you can use what the um, EVM pipeline output does, at least for the new uh, data sets. And so at least for this method, the kind of CAS conversions, again, are currently being tested. Um, and just to show this kind of primary beam correction in action, this is uh, from my 2018 paper of the Goods North, where this is the Applesburg primary beam. And we used some crude estimates of primary beam models in order to accurately correct for the, the partially accurately correct for the primary beam response. So the final way in which we can, you know, remove all the errors as long as we have perfect beam models is to do a projection. Um, and this corrects for the primary beam response as we grid our visibilities. Um, and at the moment, this is uh, implemented in, in what we call the image domain gridder uh, method, which is part of the WS clean package and so not part of CASA. Um, and this corrects for the primary beam effects with much smaller errors than the other methods. Um, so on the, on the right hand side, we've got the, the A projection kernel. So these are our voltage responses of our various telescopes. This is the uh, Effelsberg 100 meter telescope, TMR, Jodrell -Jod Bank, which are bigger. You can see their, their, their attenuation. And then we can use the, the, um, these models to then give us a lovely smooth RMS map of our target field. And if you have perfect beams, you get perfect corrections. Well, possibly. Um, but the advantage of using this method as well is that we can also implement more complex beams. So you, um, you can do some true frequency dependence. You can do the rotation of the beams, uh, just choose the amounts and the parallactic angle. Um, but also, you know, this method can do other direction dependent effects such as pointing errors, tech dispersion across your, your field of view, which um, in principle can be calibrated this way. Um, and so just to kind of know all of these kind of correction schemes will be easy for the user to use and will be is planned in, in this, uh, this field BI pipeline. But crucially, this is not native to CASA. So with all of these advancements put together, you know, wide field surveys and VLBI have come a long way. It, you know, this is an example from the Goods North field, one of my, my favorite fields in the world. From, and this is Mike Garrett's where there's, um, in the center, we've got the KPNO optical image in the background with the Vestavork synthesis radio telescope on top as the contours. And then there was a VLBI survey with the EVN. And there was kind of two and a half uh, detections here and as we go, you know, more into the future, the techniques came along. We had Chi in 2013, uh, which was observed in 2004, which looking at the same field now detected uh, 12 uh, VLBI sources. And then now, you know, we're looking at tens of sources in a single pointing. This is from my 2018 paper, which saw 31 sources and half of these sources aren't even in the field of view of the original uh, WSLT and KPNO image. So my kind of key takeaways just for the last minute is that, you know, why field VLBI has many use cases. And if you have other things it might be useful for, then go for it. Um, the initial calibration is very simple. Everything um, is easily parallelized and it's becoming user friendly. Um, some of the calibration techniques that I've outlined are applicable to standard VLBI observations. So like multi self-cal, for example, and at least, you know, kind of at least for the moment, the final hurdle of primary beam corrections is currently being overcome. And uh, you guys can, can use this for your, uh, for your, your future wide field VLBI needs. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. That was a very interesting presentation. I'm glad to see that the primary beam correction for the EVN telescopes is finally getting handled properly. Um, there's already some questions popping in. If you have any more, feel free to start posting in the, the Q&A or in the MetaMost channel number 10, Wide Field Imaging. I'll hand over the floor to Ivan, who is our question master for this yes. afternoon. Okay. So yeah, at the moment, uh, there are two questions in the Q&A uh, at Zoom. So uh, one of them, the first of them is from Sumit, 
who asks um, in the pipeline to make white field imaging, what parameters are required? So, so, so how much information you need to, to configure the, the, the white field imaging? Is it automatic or requires some manual intervention? Uh, in principle, at the moment, it's manual. But in principle, there's at least code behind the scenes at the moment, which would take your UV coverage and work out what the, the standard parameters are that you need to make the image. Um, the key thing for it that maybe I didn't say properly is that with wide field VLBI, you've got these multiple phase centers. So you're just making little images um, which aren't necessarily mosaic into your, you know, 300,000K by 300,000K image because that would be silly. So um, yeah, so at least for the, the, the pipeline, it will be, it will be uh, uh, automatic. Okay. There is an, there is a, an, well, did, 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 did this answer the question or maybe Sumit has? Uh, <laughs> yeah, he can, he can follow up if there's more questions or if it wasn't clear. But I, I would like to add one thing, which I found is always a bit confusing, especially for people coming from the Alma site. They are used to doing mosaics, which actually images the entire primary beam. In VLBI, as Jack pointed out, we only do small subsections of the entire primary beam because most of the area you're looking at is noise. And you don't need to image the noise. You only Im image the parts where you know there's a source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, the, again, there's another question from uh, Yoon who asks for multi for multi-source phase calibration, how densely the phase centers should be sampled for the descent primary beam correction? Uh, so the, the multi-source phase calibration is not necessarily for primary beam correction. Um, primary beam correction is just depending on what telescopes are in your array. Um, for if you're talking about, you know, uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of answered it maybe, but yeah. So it's kind of, maybe there's a little bit of confusion that the multi-source phase calibration is not for for primary beam correction per se. Um, so normally you would apply your primary beam correction before you do any self calibration of your target field. So you want to remove those amplitude errors straight off. And that is done just by knowing what the, the, the primary beams look like, which you can get you know, from the observatory. Or you will be able to get from the observatory. OK. So yeah, yeah, it's it's actually it's quite subtle to to the, to disentangle uh, what would be the yeah the phase correction and then uh, but you also need amplitude correction. <laughs> we are far from yeah. the phase center. It's a little bit confusing. Yeah. So if we move to 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 the matter most, there has been some interaction already. Uh, so uh, Yoon was asking what field size we were talking about. And uh, there has been uh, there has been some uh, there has been an answer from uh, from Benito who says that roughly producing imaginary placement within a primary beam of the telescope arc minutes at gigahertz frequencies. So that would be the the the, the order of magnitude, let's say, of the of the primary beams. Um, but that but these wouldn't would not imply a single image with that field, but a smaller individual images centered at different places within that range, which is what what Ilse was was noticing actually. So, and then Yun was asking again, is this multiple phase center correlation so-called direction dependent calibration? Oh, uh, I, he said it, the question was addressed already, but okay, if you wanna elaborate on that, that would be. Uh, in principle, the multiple cell calibration is not direction dependent. It works the same way as if you did self-cal on your field. Um, it has one advantage that it retains uh, relative astrometry. Um, but in principle, um, there is at least someone, one of my colleagues here is uh, making a direction dependent version, which then will just group the sources in different parts of your primary beam and then make some phase screen. So you interpolate your solutions across your, your primary beam and then it in effect becomes direction dependent. Um, but yeah, it just, the muscle self cal just acts as a, as a, uh, a way to increase your, your signal to noise available to do standard self calibration on your target field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then there has been some comments from Perez Torres about the primary beam of the EVN, which goes in the line of the fact that the EVN is quite heterogeneous, okay? Because he was telling that, yeah. 
for Ethelsberg, for instance, which is the largest disk, one gets uh, rather small values, but for the rest of antennas, even is very homogeneous. So how you compute the primary even for EVN experiments, which is what you have addressed actually in the last, in the last slides. And then uh, Perez Torres says in slide 19, okay, yes, yeah, so Perez Torres just posted something else. So it looks like the peak to the right in slide 19. So if you could go back to that uh, one. Yeah. The peak, uh, it seems that uh, the peak to the right is much higher than the peak to the left. So an SNR increment should come up from decreasing RMS noise rather than increasing the peak brightness, but I, which, which I think is the effect of correcting from the primary beam, right? No, so yeah, the, the multi cell self calibration is just correcting for the phases. So this is just your, you know, you're pulling flux, which has been scattered into the noise because of the atmosphere. This is not doing any primary beam stuff. So um, you're just pulling back the flux, which has been scattered into the noise, which increases your signal noise. So it's a combination of both decreasing the RMS and increasing the, the source um, peak. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so then Pedro Torres uh, asks about the computational costs. So, so how costly is this correlation-wise to, to, to perform this wide field uh, uh, imaging? Oh, I need I need Ardon here to uh, to answer this one. Uh, you have, you have Mark. Uh, Mark uh, yes, yeah, so Mark has I'm said up. that can answer to that. Yes. So th there there is a there, there's two issues here. There's a small additional cost per phase center. Um, but uh, Jack didn't say this, um, but he uses in these, these fields, he uses, well, seven, 800 face centers. Um, so 700 times a small additional cost is still a significant cost. Um, and um, these big ones really take us, uh, us quite a bit of time uh, to correlate because the, the correlator is actually constrained by the amount of memory that we have and not by the amount of, uh, of CPUs that are in it. Um, so yes, correlating such an experiment can take up, up to a week, but adding a few phase centers to do the, um, um, what do you call it, Jack, the multi- Multi-source self-cal. Yeah, multi-source self-cal. Um, that is almost free. So that's uh, maybe a 30% cost, uh, extra cost uh, for correlating at high, higher spectral resolution and then a small cost for each additional phase centers. But up to 10, that's almost nothing. So un un unless you want to, to really do these wide fields and have lots and lots of, of phase centers, um, you shouldn't hesitate to propose. Oh, by the way, so, so Yun has just posted that uh, the slide uh, uh, re uh, related to the comment about the primary beam was slide 32 where we're showing multiple phase center pointings. So the question was, uh, how frequently do you sample to characterize the primary beam of the wide field? Ah, I see, okay. So about this reading. Um, yeah, so this is just an example to show how the, uh, the stepwise primary beam correction happens. So the, the blue points are, are just example phase centers that you may give to the EVN. You don't want to do this because Mark and the EVN people will hate you for doing it. Um, but yeah, so you just, with this method of primary beam correction, you just correct for the primary beam at the center of these um, phase centers. So you, you can imagine you're gonna get a, for every point here, you end up with a, a, a small data set. And then you just apply a gain table to that data set with the, the, the corrected, the primary beam response. Um, and then you essentially end up with an RMS which is flat across, but you've just removed these horrible amplitude errors. Um, so, you know, if you, whether you want to look at, you know, doing the entire primary beam is very dependent on what the correlator people will, will 
average your data down to. So the kind of the distance between adjacent phase centers here is just dependent on how much averaging the uh, once the initial wide field correlation has happened, you then shift and then you average them down. And it depends how much that averaging goes down is by how um, separated you'd need to to do these points in order to map the primary beam. Um, so that's very much on the um, the correlator side and, and what you decide and they decide. It's very user user dependent that way. Um, so but yeah, again, often you would never ever do this. You you target VLA sources. You'd average down really really heavily because you only care about a few art seconds around that that um, that VLA source or so low resolution source. The idea is that if you do more averaging, you need to sample more closely the primary beam. Yeah. But yeah, again, you wouldn't ever cover the entire primary beam. This is just a kind of an example to show how the primary beam correction currently works. May I ask some, uh, well, or, or make a quick comment about the case of ALMA and uh, the, the Atacama compact array? You know that well, there, there has been some discussion in the, in the last years, actually, about what was better to do when for, to combine the main array and the compact array data. So there was one opinion that was dealing, was basically defending the combination in the image plane, because each each one of the two arrays is homogeneous, but the two arrays themselves they have different sizes. So so correcting on the image plane each one of them separately is trivial. Then you can just combine the images once they are corrected for the primary beam. But the other option was to combine them in Fourier space, and that's not trivial because even though they, you have two disconnected arrays that have uh, that are homogeneous themselves, <laughs> then you have uh, baseline dependent uh, corrections that are different yeah, in, in Fourier space. So how you would you deal with this special case? Would it be, uh, would, would there be something that would be simplified in the analysis? The fact to have two uh, arrays that are disconnected among themselves, but you combine them in Fourier space? Yeah, um, I guess, well, I haven't really thought about it too much, but off the top of my head, it definitely helps the fact that yeah, these are all the baselines are between themselves. So at least the um, primary beam correction is pretty simple because you only have two models, and then you could use that for each one of those separately. Because the big the big issue. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, yeah, that's no. In case I was yeah. understanding what you were saying, so you basically you don't have two e's uh, to the this correct this uh, the direction independent corrections multiplied that are different. The measurement equation because you don't have baselines from one array to the other. That's what. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's those it's those interconnecting baselines that are the big problem, generally. Um, but yeah, I guess you could do something like through the a projection method, but. Instead, you just feed it two primary beams, which makes it much simpler. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and at least uh, this new image domain grid is really, for doing A projection, it's quite, um, it's A is quite flexible. These these kernels are just FITS files, so you just sample your, your model into the FITS file. Um, it, and it's computationally, well, it's computationally expensive, but it's also accelerated by GPU, so. Um, it actually is, is quite quick um, to do it. GPU implementation, that's in CASA? Uh, no, this is separate. It's part of, oh. well, it's, <laughs> it's WS Clean. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I think we have time for one short question, if there is an, anything left. Well, yeah, I had, I had the question, um, which is T-Clean claims to have an A projection implementation as well. Did you try using that one? Uh, the issue is that I have no idea how to get, I've tried it. I've tried it for many years of how to get the primary beam models into CASA properly and for it to work properly. Um, so whenever we've tried to get it to work within the VP package and then we compare it to using other packages, it's never what we expect it to be. And I don't know why. <laughs> That's the best way to describe it. <laughs> Actually, I think I think I, I have a possible explanation because I was also playing with this <laughs> for the case of Alma and the ACA, and it seems that there's some quantities hardwired to the code 
so that even if you change the antenna table and, and, uh, and provide the size of your telescopes and the definition of the primary beams and so on, CASA is too boring and it still keeps using the values that are hardwired and they don't work for some reason. That's interesting. So, so if you provide the name of an observatory, they have some values which are hardwired there and there's no way, absolutely no way to override them. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what we got to as well when we tried to put email in into it. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, uh, there's one, there's one last question in the uh, in the Q and A, but I think we can move to the uh, Mattermost. Mattermost. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't see anything else in the Mattermost, uh, and uh, no new. Uh, is there anything new that I didn't get, or not in no. the Mattermost? Okay, so it seems that there's nothing, nothing added. So I think that's uh, that's it for the question and answers. Awesome, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Oh, sorry, sorry. There's, <laughs> there's in the question and answer. There's a new one. Yeah, sorry for it. So uh, Sumit is asking again if in an heterogeneous array, primary beam of which station can be fully made? So the small, the smallest antenna or the largest one? Um, if I wasn't constrained by correlators, I would say any of them. But <laughs> but yeah, no, you would you would never want to do the entire problem beam. You just want to look for sources that are already there. So don't don't give the jive correlator people headaches because they already hate me. Um, so I've, I've they've had to redo the correlator twice if I remember right because of my project. So uh, um, but yeah, no. In principle, you can image as much as as far as you want. Um, you know, have a look at the the uh, have a look at the Cosmos two gigahertz data, which goes all the way to the edge of the VLPA primary beams, um, targeting VLA sources out of there. Um, take a look at the the M drive survey as well, which is the same. So, you know, you can you can use this technique in principle to map thousands of degrees in VLBI, but just make sure you pre-select those those sources on something that's already there, um, unless you're mad and you want to search for stuff that's variable that's not going to appear in observations at a different time. Okay, now now I think that's it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> exactly. It was it was fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> There's a few more popping up in the metabolism, but it's time to wrap up because we've got the, the next uh, event coming up, which is our walk. Um, and actually we have a little bit more time for that because it's followed by the break. If you need more, uh, if you need instructions on how to uh, register your step counts, they are all on the wiki page. And I will make a dedicated channel in the, the Mattermost as well for the box in case you have no uh, issues with, if you, in case you have issues with uh, signing up for the, uh, the online system. Please do give that a try because it makes our life a lot easier. But if this for somehow, for some reasons is, is blocked in your country or you have other issues with it, um, Go and look for the dedicated channel, which will appear in Mattermost uh, in the next 10 minutes. We reconvene for the data processing session. Let me check at four o'clock UT here in the next plenary session. I will share the link also in the general channels. Thank you very much, Jack, for a, a very interesting talk. Um, We're on all for our walks and it's actually quite funny to realize that. Several people will be walking with me, but I will not be able to see you all until we get back here and uh, share our images. So share pictures, let us know what you've been doing, and then we'll see you at 4UT. Okay, I'm going for the work of uh, Ilse, but may I ask uh, Jack a question? Uh, oh, sure. Since he's, he, yeah. you are still here, um, <laughs> but is, is it possible to do multi-frequency wide field? Uh, I mean, uh, or would you choose a preferred frequency to do a wide field uh, VLBI survey? Uh, I, think, I think it's just dependent on the, your field of view, right? Because the, the primary beam scales as lambda over D. So if you did it, you could do it in five gigahertz, but you haven't got much 
area to to search for so it can be done at any any frequency it's just the lower the better if you want to go wide uh, but if you if you cared about other things in your field very close by just drop a phase sensor on it should be fine yeah, no, I was thinking for, of course, for the lensing uh, science, which is not very efficient with the wide field, uh, obviously, but uh, just because it's a very small probability. But when you have multi-frequency information at the same time, you can already say this is a lens, this is not a lens. And so, of yeah. course, this has some issues to, because of what you said, but um, okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, no worries. All right, enjoy your walks. I'm going to drive home, so that's going to be my walk. <laughs> See, <laughs> See you. <ya. laughs> Bye. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up now the questions and say. Good, excellent. Thanks, Sivan. So, what do I, do I send them to to Jack for them to revise for, um, for you to revise? The ones that. The ones that are still open in the Q&A, you can copy and paste them into the, the Metamost channel and, and tag Jack to, to answer them there. But I think- ah, Okay, I, so I just, I just copy paste them. Yeah, you have to copy paste. I thought there was a way to, uh, to save the, the Q&A, but there's only a way to save the chat functions. Okay, is... yeah, so yeah, wait, wait a moment so I can- I'm, uh, I'm not going anywhere, I'll leave it open for- Because what Casey was doing yesterday, she, she, she wrote an answer and yeah. then she sent me an email to to yeah to just to, to, to yeah, yeah Miguel, I was trying to 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 write the answers. I thought that we had to write the answers, but actually I was yeah. So I thought I, I should I should do the same. <laughs> but okay, uh, just, it, it, you see, you're smarter. You're smarter than me. <laughs> I tried this morning to type the answer as the question was being answered live, which works in some cases. But if I don't quite understand the details, then it. Uh, quickly deteriorate. So, yeah. Yeah, well, that's why I checked. But the questions have Sorry? putting them. Sorry? That's why I, I sent first my, my proposed answers to you to double check. Okay, so in the end, in the end, I don't have to, so <laughs> just don't No, in the that. end, I think you don't need to answer them. You, you just copy okay. them into the Mattermost and say, hey, Jack, answer it, please. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Ilsa, are you still there? I'm still here. So, so did you did you show this morning some distribution of the countries that, or are you saving that for last? Uh, it, it's on the wiki page actually. Oh, let me. Uh, the, the 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 tool that you uh, suggested was actually quite pricey. So oh, it's um, free. No, Sorry? no. Well, I thought it was free. It it is up to twenty five people. Mm, okay. And, and all these things we looked into quite a few options for the polls and quizzes. And all these things are quite expensive if you want to do this in, in events of this size. So uh, uh, Olga found one which was uh, a per event uh, subscription. So we, we only buy it for this event, which was the cheapest option. But it was, uh, yeah, it was somewhat of a nasty disappointment because you're not used to handling this many numbers of uh, this. Uh, oh, I see, I see the, there's the map, super nice. Yes, if you click on it, you can actually zoom in and out in there. Okay, and it shows the zip code. Yes, yes, I, I had to use data which were not uh, under the GDPR uh, protection, so I could only use zip codes and places for people. Very nice to see that. It's a really nice distribution. I was really happy with it. It would be interesting to see if we can map that onto the actual participants on the channels, but it seems we're roughly having about 50% of the people in the, in the lectures. But you'll see, I can't see Hawaii there. You can, you can or you can't. No, it doesn't appear in the in. Ah, well, I can, 
Uh, no, no, I, I can't. It is. I can't. It is there. It, it's, it's just really, really west of the United States. But there is something which is HY. So I, I think it's Hawaii. Oh, I can no longer see the map because it's telling me I need to pay for it now. Whoops. <laughs> but the, the image is still there on the, uh, that's, that's a PNG image on the Casa Wiki. And that's what you get with all these things. Once you start using it extensively, people say, oh, now you have to pay for it. That's weird because I can, I can see it. I can, but if I, Look, here is Hawaii. Yeah. I don't know. I just I was just wondering whether there was somebody from there also because oh, I can oh, see it in the, in the wiki. <laughs> oh, by by the way, Casey, I, I have I have up, uploaded the, the the scripts that uh, oh, that uh, Miguel was asking yesterday. Mm -hmm. I, I realized that I was actually using a, a, a wide bandwidth, much wider than what I than what I said. So it was I was using one gigahertz, and I and I said I was using half a gigahertz. So oh, I have a two. half a gigahertz. <laughs> it improves a bit, and then I and and, uh, and then I set the the spectral index to minus two, to just go <laughs> back to wild. <laughs> okay, so the images will not be exactly the same as the ones I showed yesterday, but but still it it's, uh, it works. Yeah. So you see, there is lots of people from in Africa. There's lots yeah. of people in India. India and Indonesia even. Yes. Nobody from Japan on or is no. No, but the, the Japan is really pushing it in the time zones. I think this is at minus ten or something. So they really hardly overlap with us. Yeah, and more northern than this, no. No. It no. could be, huh? There is there is institutes there. Yeah, and even in Northern Europe there is. So of course. So we have still also people from Australia. One. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody in the in the South Pole Observatory. Nope. No, no, nobody in the South Pole Telescope. Or it should be more there. Oh, I'll stop with this. <laughs> but it's very fun. Yeah, it's Thank fun to for, for yeah. having that. And it, it, this was actually fairly simple to make as well. Just copy and paste the the the, the zip codes, and it, it generates this map. Mm-hmm. And you do that for every day? No, just for the, the, the full list of registrants. So it's it's everybody who registered uh, online. Mm -hmm. on the map. And uh, for the, the actual participants at this point, I'm not sure. I think Benito said he had some scripts to, uh, to check. But I've not been following in too much detail who is present and who is not. No, well, it's, it's, it's not to hound people down or anything. No, it's just fun to see with whom you are talking to at the moment. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah. Now it's it, it would be interesting to note this because we had some discussions before in the organizing committee whether we wanted to to charge a registration fee to avoid people registering and and then not showing up. But that was so much work to uh, to set this up, especially because people can't come here; they have to find a way to transfer money. <laughs> So we decided not to do that, but then you, you get quite a significant number of people who register and never show up. And I think that is around 50%. 50, because the first day they were 120, 130 participants. Yeah, the first